Coming up on Garden Talk. The biggest variable for me that I've noticed is the phenotypes. Genetics, 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 but the phenotype within the genetic has been a big focus for me for the past like maybe five years. Sometimes you end up getting a bunch of variations that are keepers. I just was over at a buddy's house today and he had so many that they were dramatically different enough that they should almost have different names. Make sure you label properly. It's so crucial. It's so important. You'll be so bummed out when you're like, oh man, I didn't label this pheno right and that was the best one. Like It could be this or it's this and it takes three more cycles to find out. They'll see somebody who's just knocking out of the park. They got to realize they got a very good phenotype, potentially good cut or they've hunted the right one, or they just got lucky. That happens sometimes too. But finding the right characteristic expression within that particular genetic, I think is huge for any grower to get the best results. What's up everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, AKA Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This episode number 69. In this episode, I interview Rob from CLTV. He is back for a second time on this podcast. This time around, he's going to get deep into the process of phenol hunting plants, something he has a ton of experience doing. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero costs for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. A big supporter of this podcast is AC Infinity. They sponsor this podcast and I use their products. AC Infinity now has gardening tools and accessories such as heavy duty fabric grow pots, trimmers, grow room glasses, drying racks, plant ties, and trellis nets. They also have all of the equipment needed for a ventilation system. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and you can use discount code MrGrowIt during checkout for a discount on their products. Thanks to Spider Farmer for being a sponsor. A new grow light they released here in 2022 is the SE1000W. This was designed specifically for those of you who run CO2 in your grow space and really want to maximize the light intensity. It has a 10 bar design for an even light spread pulls 1000 watts from the wall and comes in at 2.9 micromoles per joule efficacy. The recommended coverage area is 4 feet by 4 feet or 5 feet by 5 feet. Use discount code MrGrowIt5 to save on all Spider Farmer products and I'll leave a link in the video description section below. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today I am joined with Rob from CLTV. How are you doing today? Hey, brother. I'm doing great, man. Happy to be back on the show. I feel like I, I don't see you enough, so I'm happy you brought me over here. <laughs> I was going to say, you're no stranger to Garden Talk Podcast, right? You are on episode number one. The very first episode of this podcast was you. And uh, we talked all about fertilizing plants. That one actually has over 261,000 views. So it's like the, the second most viewed on YouTube. And then, of course, it's on all podcast platforms as well. But a ridiculous mm -hmm. amount of people tuned into that. And there was a ridiculous amount of people that had uh, real positive things to say about you, about that discussion. And people want you back for a part two. So thanks for coming back here. Dude. Yeah, my lips dried out with all that love there. That's pretty awesome, man. I really appreciate <laughs> that, dude. That is that's that's really cool, especially to see a conversation like that that gets to the nitty gritty of basics, and then you built so much more on the podcast. You know what I'm saying? It went to ne next level science. So it's really cool to see the inception to where it is now. Yeah, pretty incredible. So today yeah. we're going to get deep into pheno hunting. This is something that you have several experience with. And uh, you're very passionate about it, too. So I'm really excited for this one. But first, can you introduce yourself to those that didn't catch the first episode we did together? Yeah. Uh, if you don't know, I'm Rob from uh, CLTV, From the Stash, Top Buds, Rob Blogs, three different channels. Um, been a grower now for about 14 years. Uh, medical program here, as long as it's been available, since 2008. So... We'll just say I've been growing legally for 14 years. Um, definitely have some experience with other plants, but my main favorite is our, is our favorite herb. And overall, since making content, I feel like I, teaching people, I've learned a lot as well. I've changed, I've pivoted, I've grown with synthetics, organics, and the biggest variable for me that I've noticed is the phenotypes. Genetics, 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 but the phenotype within the genetic has been a big focus for me for the past like maybe five years. Once I really got got away from the pick and mix and focused a little bit more on finding the variety within the single cultivar. 
genetics are just so important. I mean, that's like the emphasis on it sometimes I don't think is enough between particularly new growers. Like they don't understand the importance of genetics. Like you can have a dialed in environment, you know, lighting, so on and so forth. Nutrition can be dialed in. But if you have bad genetics, I mean, it's just it's not going to come out anywhere near it would as if you had good genetics. So, um, yeah, phenotypes, genotypes. Let's get into it. Uh, let's dial it back for beginners, though. Like, what is pheno hunting and why do it? So, good question. There's actually a lot of debate, kind of the bro science side of pheno hunting. People argue pheno or geno hunting. This is kind of a thing. But pheno hunting, I feel, is more, of course, finding the characteristic expression within the cultivar. So, I use the analogy of, let's say, you have the same parents and you've got brothers and sisters, but you all are a little unique, but you all maybe have the same gap like myself, if you don't know, if you're just listening, or you all have uh, you know, hair color that everybody's got red hair. Well, it's a genetic trait that's carried through, but there's still individuality between each, each sibling. So it's comparable when you see a cultivar, it's going to be similar there. And then plus the genetic expression within your environment. So looking for the right cultivar, when you say you want to get a certain genetic, it may not even be that same genetic. I, for example, had a, uh, I think it was Agent Orange, Orange something, I can't remember what it was, but there was one cultivar, one version of it, essentially, one phenotype that was very Java coffee-like and one that was very citrus and orange. I unfortunately was in the pick and mix phase of not knowing, you know, different genetic expressions. So I got the Java one and was like, this is bunk. I don't like this. And it's like, well, it was not the right phenotype. And that's really, you know, it took me about nine years before I started really realizing, I'm like, man, I'm comparing apples to oranges, so to speak. I'm, I'm comparing my buddy's totally different cultivar, essentially. I mean, it's the same, but it's different, different char characteristic expressions that came from it. So that's when I really dove into pheno hunting. And I thought that when you're looking for genetics, you're not looking for just genetics. You're looking for a particular phenotype within that genetic. So it's changed my whole approach. And I think a lot of people, when they look at one of their buddy grows, they'll see somebody who's just knocking out of the park. They got to realize they got a very good phenotype, potentially good cut, or they've hunted the right one, or they just got lucky. That happens sometimes too. But, but finding the right characteristic expression within that particular genetic, I think is huge for any grower to get the best results. Yeah, so each seed is its own phenotype, right? If you were to grow one plant and then take clones of that plant, that's still the same phenotype. So just a couple things to mention there for, for those that don't know. Uh, but yeah, there can be so much variability depending on the genetics, depending on you know what generation it is. Is it inbreeding that's done? How far down has it gone? Now we're kind of getting to, to breeding a little bit. We're not going to really touch on that topic deeply, but genetics, there's variations that happen with characteristics, like you mentioned, and the environment definitely comes into play heavily uh, yeah. when it comes to uh, different phenotypes and how they express themselves. So do you pheno hunt males plants, female plants, or both? Currently just female because I'm not doing any breeding. I don't have the capacity, probably even mental capacity <laughs> to, uh, to do any breeding. I'm not on Dr. Grow its level in terms of even being a hobbyist and, and giving it a shot, mainly because right now I like to just find different flower that I like. And while I can find that with breeding, there's some amazing breeders out there that I'm going to let them do their job. And then, you know, maybe one day when, I, when I've got the space, I'll throw my hat in the ring. But for now, I like what I got. So I'm looking for females usually only. Okay, so females only, and you're starting from seed, right? And then how many seeds are you planting for your pheno hunt? It's funny. I, I thought I was doing a decent amount until we had Matt Mooney on From the Stash, and he's talking about doing 100, and he's like, yeah, just, you know, I'm going to do a little bit, just probably 100. I'm like, oh, a little bit. Oh, okay. Well, I'm doing 10 on average is normally what I've done. The most I've done is 20 at a time. And at that point, it was because I heard that there was a lot of different variations of the same cultivar. So I figured, why not? I'm looking for one in particular. I'll cut the rest off. I just want one. And sometimes it doesn't happen. It's like getting a pack of baseball cards or Pokemon cards. You're looking for a particular one, and you kind of get duds. Sometimes you end up getting a bunch of variations that are keepers. I just was over at a buddy's house today, and he had so many that they were dramatically different enough that they should almost have different names. They're not even in the same family. Like, it's it's crazy. Those are the type that I'm concerned about when you recommend it to somebody because they may not get that same phenotype as you, which is where the argument of cuts, like we talked on from the stash again, referring back of where you can't secure that exact phenotype unless you go about that process differently. You can do a major hunt, find a bunch and then keep that secured, or you have to find that cut. It's not as easy as some would think. 
it would be really nice if we could plant a hundred seeds, like you mentioned, and, and and hunt through those. But the reality of it, you know, a lot of the folks are home growers. I have a plant count. I'm sure you have a plant count as well in, in your state. So we have a maximum number that we're allowed to grow legally. So staying with that, that's certainly important. And uh, you can still have a phenol hunt within the matter of, you know, you can do like five plants, 10 plants. Like you can do a low okay. number. It doesn't have to be 100 plants in order to do a, a true phenol hunt. Like you mentioned, you might not find what you're looking for, right? So you might plant 10, 15 seeds, whatever, and then none of them are actually what you're looking for in that cultivar. Then you start over, right? You just you you kill off those plants or consume those plants, whatever, and then you just plant new seeds and, and continue your hunt. Um, that's perfectly fine. Yeah, I'm doing that right now with the chill out OG, and depending, luckily, I know the guy who happened to breed it. So worst case condition, <laughs> if I don't find the one I'm after, growth wise, they're just on point. They both look like twins, but one is hungrier than the other, and one of them is, is noticeably more tracked out than the other. But who knows at the end, you know? But it's hard because when you're limited on the phenotypes you have, you're literally kind of stuck between the two options. But it's cool, you know, at some points, but when they're so similar, that's where it's like, where do you decide? Like, which one do you keep? You know, they're like the same. And it's a good sign, but I do sometimes like those genetic variations where you have one that leans this way, more sour, more more funky, and another one that may be more deep gas or more sweet. So that way you've got a little bit of variety, but also grow very comparable. So that way your canopy, your canopy could be even, and you do it like that. You see um, Gorilla Butter, they've got white truffles. That's one that I have. That's a cut. Most people just know it as that genetic, but it's actually a named phenotype. You know, Gorilla Glue number four, that number four is a number four for a reason. You know what I'm saying? The, the phenotype is usually the number is what people did. Nowadays, to identify these particular characteristics i personally think it's okay to rename a cut as long as you give you know respect and you mention that this is a cut of this particular cultivar but it's getting to the point now where the the phenotypes are the more focused what pheno did this person have what pheno is at that dispensary what pheno did they they secure if you're just getting seeds you don't really know you're just saying ah, i got these seeds we'll see if i get it in this pack you know that's true that's very true so when you're starting your pheno hunt what medium are you using to begin? And then also, I guess, container size, container type. You can talk about that. Yeah. Um, so when I first get started, I'm usually using like a solo cup to get started with cocoa. I'm usually nine times out of 10 using Royal Gold's Tuper, but they run out often where I'm at locally. So I'll use an alternative as close as I can. I'll use maybe Coco Loco and cut it with a little bit of base regular cocoa. And if anything, add a little perlite for some aeration. And then I start really like low on my food, if any food at all to begin for nutrients, whether that be organic side or uh, mineral base is a low dose to get going. So that way I can get the the stronger growing, obviously, seed, but not overpower it and kill it and burn it when it's young. Because, again, I want to get the most natural, best characteristics and expressions from the genetics so I know which one I want to keep. From there, I'll, I'll move up to a larger pot, usually either one gallon or a three to five. It depends. If I'm using a cloth pot, sometimes I'll just go right into a five. It just, uh, I guess, more for a mess, not necessarily anything behind that. I just don't like making a big mess. And then uh, just plain water with uh, light nutrients, usually low on like 150, 200 ppm, very, very low. So using synthetic bottled nutrients yeah. or are you talking organics? Yes, yeah, for synthetic bottled nutrients. Appreciate you pulling that one out. Okay, yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned cocoa as your medium because... There are so many variables that can happen just within like the soil, for example, or within the medium. And you're starting with coker, you're starting with an inert medium. Do you have anything against starting in soil like that's pre-charged with nutrients? Does that kind of, I mean, there's so many variables. I personally feel like if you're starting in a soil that's already pre-charged with nutrients, you really don't know what's in that mix. Not every single one of those mixes can kind of be the same off of each container, I mean. But when you're in cocoa, you're starting with an inert medium, you're mixing up your nutrients at the same PPM, and you're distributing them all to the to the individual plants, right? So it's kind of like more dialed in as far as feeding. What are your thoughts on like phenol hunting and soil? I mean, certainly it can still be done within soil, but like, what are your thoughts overall on that avenue? No, I, I, that's a very, very valid question. I think if you're looking to scale or if you're in a caregiver operation or looking to go craft or commercial, that should be a big focus. You want to get the best expression, period. But if you already have an established garden, you want to integrate what works for your established garden. I don't think changing everything to fit one cultivar would make sense, unless this is the one that you need for medicine 
and it's going to change your life or your family's life, maybe. But otherwise, like, if let's say you are a firm believer using, uh, you know, build a soil and you're running that and you don't want to change because you're like, well, I've been using this mix forever, you know, then make sure it works with, with what you have. If that genetic doesn't, that phenotype doesn't, well, then it's telling you it's not meant to be in your garden. That's, that's my belief, at least personally. But if you're looking to take this as a, a business or profession or a real serious hobby, then maybe you do want to start totally clean and get the best version of that particular cultivar, the particular phenotype of the cultivar, doing it that way. I don't really think about it in that way, but that's, that's a great point that you made there. That makes sense. So you've got your plants growing, and during a pheno hunt, the plants are going to start to show different characteristics. There are many different characteristics that you can look for when pheno hunting. What characteristics do you look for? It's a good question as well. So only recently have I really, really focused on leaf to bud ratio. It wasn't a big thing for me before. Um, the stacking of the nodes, how tight the nodes are, and the leaf to bud ratio, because I'm a solo trimmer 90% of the time. And uh, big shout out AC Infinity because I got the trim bowl from them. I can use that. That'll help. But for the most part, I've had some cultivars that I let go in the past you know, couple of years. 11 Roses being one of them. It was great. Very, very nice one. But I hated trimming it. So I, that's like my first factor is like, is this a squatty, leafy mess that it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a lot of work to train it, let alone finish it? That's just like number one as I'm looking. Then that speed of growth. Now, it depends because... Prime example, Chill Out OG was a slower grower for me. It was big, wide, but not tall and lanky like my others. But the the stacking of the nodes, I was like, whew, like this growth here, I can have these big, tall, you know, Amazon women here that have stretchy nodes, or I have these shorter ones that are compact with not crazy leaves. So it's another check in the book where I'm like, man, that leaf to bud with the node stacking really makes a big difference. It kind of trumps the the speed of growth for me because, again, I'm going to potentially get more yield. Once it's in flower, it's in flower. So there's that. I don't really focus a whole lot on like the leaf size or anything in that sense, but I do look a little bit on some genetics. I notice will get those natural purple stems, like just reddish kind of purple stems. I do try to avoid those ones when I can. It just seems like they want more or less. They're a little finicky, but some cultivars lately, especially I've been noticing that they purple up as a plant and that's kind of like in the genetic makeup of it. So I look at something that doesn't show me the the tendencies of stress early on, something that's not going to show me that it may need more down the road, that it's going to fit within my cycle because I don't want to have, especially synthetic, I don't want to have multiple different containers or reservoirs with different amounts of nutrients for a couple different cultivars. If half my room's something and the other half is that, maybe. But otherwise, like if you're not working in my mix already, he got to go. It's not going it's, it's, to, that, that'll again kind of push everything out because it's like, man, I really have to work hard to make you last versus, I mean, you got to put in work, but if I'm already putting work over here and what's already established and what I like, I'm not going to throw the risk over here with this pheno hunt to take something in that's going to mess up my whole cycle. And then once we're in the flower, of course, I'm looking at, you know, trichome production. I'm looking at, um, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm, huge on bud structure per se. I don't want foxtail stuff, but I do like some stuff that's got some density. I don't like super airy, you know, fluffy, sativa-like, so to speak, in terms of plant growth uh, structure. So I'm trying to find something that, that fits and has that tightness to it, but also has the trichomes to look. Color is not a big deal at all for me personally. I'd, purple is just purple. But when you get that, it's a nice perk to be like, wow, look at this exotic stuff here. Change the game, you know? It's, it's not a huge deal. But the number one factor for me, number, number one, is those terps. Terps and flavonoids. Flavonoids you find out later, but the terps. If I'm smelling that and I don't smell anything, or if it smells like something I don't like at all, it's like I'm <laughs> getting rid of these clones right now. I don't even want to do this. I'm not even going to keep her around personally. Okay, so you named off a large handful of things that relate to the morphology of the plant uh, and also the, the chemo type as well you, you talked about. Now, how about... Do you look at when the plant starts to flower at all or the total flowering time? Does that matter to you at all or no? Total flowering time is one for me. Only recently, again, I find that out with the GMO where I was like, I could wait 13 weeks. Worst case, I pull these others. These two are still in here for a little while and I'm good. Well, if you grow them like your others, they're huge and take up space and your canopy is wonky and weird because of that setup. Depending on your setup, if you've got a four by four, it might be the whole tent. If you've got a larger space or an open space, it's throwing everything off. And I can't stand that. I can't stand the 
something that's going to be a staggered cultivar that doesn't necessarily give me the results I want. So if I know it's going to be a long one, it usually doesn't even make it into the grow. This one was just sheer ignorance, me not looking it up. So, yeah, I don't necessarily focus too heavy on that. But I guess at the, in the same same side, like a late bloomer, so to speak, something that's nece- it doesn't get going quicker, that also is an issue for me too sometimes because right now I'm dealing with that with the um, the white truffles. It's like I'm, I have to grow that all together. Otherwise, it just seems like my canopy fills out. It stretches longer than the others do. It, it keeps that stretch going versus the others start flowering quicker. And I'm like, man, I've got a canopy that slides down like a mountain for, and I don't have to put it up on crates or something to make it real even. And when you're using trellising or anything for stability, that could be a real headache. So I guess I do look at both factors. They're just not as crucial other than the time of how long it takes. I'm not doing 13 weeks anymore, ever. Okay, and then going back to the smell, one of the common techniques that people use when they're phenol hunting is the stem rub technique. So they'll take their fingers and they'll basically rub the stem and then they'll smell their fingers and see if they're it's what they like, it's what they're looking for. Do you do that technique at all or are you doing something else? You know, I, I have in the past and... Usually if it's got a sharp smell, then usually there's sharp terpenes. But the distinctness, distinctiveness of that terpene I don't get from the stem rub. I get either, if anything, like a lime with chlorophyll, cucumbery kind of smell, but it's sharp where I'm like, ooh, that's good. It smells, it smells like flower, you know, but not like the gas or like the berry or whatever the actual flower really gives. But when I smell one, then it smells like nothing. It's like it's nothing there you know i don't, literally don't smell anything that's going to be different for me because i just right off the bat my assumption this could be placebo my assumption is the flower is going to be the same way so then i it just drops down in my book when i'm like in my phone i'll usually document everything in google keep and then i have uh, evernote that i'll use for like just backing up the specific details i don't always have to add a lot of stuff but if there's something like that i'll be like this one smells like cardboard there's <laughs> nothing here this is drywall Okay. And then another common thing that people do is they'll deliberately stress their plants uh, at certain times throughout their grow. Now they do it for for various reasons, right? They could do a a stress for feeding purposes to see how well it handles nutrients. They could do stress to try to bring out more trichome development. Are you doing any type of precision stress throughout the grow at all while you're phenol hunting? So my first run, and I feel like you'll probably ask me about this at a certain point, my first run when I'm doing a phenol hunt, I don't do a whole lot to the plant. Sometimes I'll, I'll barely even low stress train or top it. You know what I'm saying? Just because I want to see what it does naturally. I've had a few cultivars that grow like Christmas trees and I've had a few that come out looking like they've been topped, like naturally topped themselves. I'm like, well, how do I have so many colas on this when I did nothing? That for me shows a lot of just natural characteristics for the growth. Then after that, I'm like, all right, well, what can I do to manipulate this better? Should I do more of an aggressive high stress training or should I do like an actual lower technique, lower stress technique? And at that point, it's usually the second or third run before I even really start to get to manipulation in that area. Now with, with nutrient stress, I usually never do that because I've already, I have a perpetual growth. So I'm already running ones that I like in there. So I'm not going to just increase heavy on the PPM or the EC just for the one. But if I'm doing a full room, like I did recently with the, uh, the truffles, which is a particular pheno I had, but it's, do I want to keep this genetic in my garden? I ended up going higher in everything. Like even my light was more intense just to see how it, it turned out. And it handled the stress pretty well. Tons of trichomes. The fade was insane on it. Looked better than any I've seen in person, personally, of any of these truffles. And I can't take the credit for it. It just seems like that genetic can take a little more. And in its defense, will express more, you know, cool color, more trichomes, more terpenes, more things like that. So I don't go too hard early, but I give it some time to integrate it into my garden before I really, you know, hit it. Gotcha. And then you did touch upon training a little bit. Uh, I know some folks, what they'll do is they'll go as far as, you know, in order to test like, the vigor of the plant, they'll actually snap branches to see how the branches snap. Do you do anything like that or no? I don't, but I, I've got a buddy who does that all the time. He's very, very, very aggressive with the plant to see, like, see if it ends up getting seeds or something. I'm like, oh, I'm trying to see if it Hermes, which I guess I, you know, I get where that comes in. Because what if an accident happens once you have this in production, so to speak? You really should stress test it. Just like anything that goes to market, it gets a stress test. If you give it the most perfect environment, it's like, yeah, of course it does good. But, you know, (laughs) move it to somewhere more difficult and it's not going to perform the same way. So giving a good stress test could help. Me personally, I don't don't go that hard with it. I don't want to break them. My goal at the end is to have a decent amount of 
high quality uh, product. And if I'm delaying the, the flowering period or the vegging period by doing some stuff like that, it's not beneficial to me personally, unless I have a lot of, you know, clones from that particular phenotype. So that's usually the second run where I'll get a little more wild, second or third. And I'm like, oh, let's see what this does. Let's see if I top this or bend this down or just crack this over here. See, put a little tape around it, see if it recovers, you know, and it it's good to find out. But then at that point, I've already kind of decided what I've liked in terms of flavor. So then it's like, is this that much better of a grower that I can sacrifice a little bit of the terpenes and a little bit of the end result product for this? And I guess the mentality for me isn't the same as for someone who's looking for production for, you know, caregiver, well, caregiver side of hand, but we'll just say other reasons. Wink, wink, if you're not watching. But some people may be focused heavier on the yield and they could sacrifice a little bit of the terpenes. And more and more people don't care as much about terpenes, which sounds crazy, but I'm realizing this. People just like myself who will drink Corona or Bud Light or Miller Light aren't chasing after the flavor of beer as much as we are the effect of beer. As we're somebody, you know, same with flavor for, for flour, they may not be looking for that crazy unique terpene but they want something in the ballpark a light undertone so somebody may be looking at a characteristic or treating it a certain way for different variables than myself that's a really good way to put it it seems like more and more people are caring less about biomass and more about things like blood density um, terpenes you know, so on and so forth i'm actually doing a phenol hunt right now so for those that don't know i have my own cross it's brisker og male i cross with a female of Pakistan Valley, and that's named Chilo Doji. It's actually um, inbreeding. I'm gone down to generation F2 right now. I'm working on that, going to an F3, but I don't do any training. I didn't do any training this run, just letting the plants grow naturally, seeing how its natural shape occurs, right? I was looking particularly for that branching to naturally come out versus, I mean, I get some cultivars where you just got that one cola coming straight up and really not much side branching, but having that branching and having a more even structure, it's easier to train in the future, have that even canopy, even bud structure across all the branches, so on and so forth. So yeah, I'm just like you where I don't really do much training. I just kind of look at the plant naturally and see how is that structure looking you know yeah 100 percent. i think that's where you can really decide if this genetic just out of the gate is a beast just like i mean anybody can be an athlete if you train enough and you work out enough and you take the right supplements maybe even steroids if you're weird like that but whatever you want to do you can get to that point too and some people are natural athletes where they're just this ox and just a tank and it's like man you're a lineman like look at trey and look at me i could not defend you running down to the, to, the finish line like, I may push one person. Trey will debo somebody. Nandamakan Zoo style, step on you walking through. Boom, boom. You'll see that with plants, too. You'll see some big, hardy monsters that are just these next level ones that you don't have to do as much work to, and you're yielding like crazy. And others that you really have to manipulate to get to that point. So, you really want to see the natural characteristics, I feel, in a phenol hunt before you, you do that. I agree. I do want to go back to lighting for a few minutes here. Uh, you touched upon it a little bit. Some people are actually going to push their plants with lighting. So they're trying to, they're, they're measuring the PPFD, they're measuring that PAR, and they're trying to increase it and give it a, the maximum amount as possible and seeing how the plants are going to react. Other people, what they're doing is they're lowering the light level and they're kind of making sure that the plant isn't suffering. You know what I mean? That it's, it's, it's coming across without having issues that it's like a normal grow, I guess you could say, nothing extreme. Are you doing any sort of light manipulation, uh, either stressing it with more light or are you just kind of having normal light le levels or reduced light levels when you are phenol hunting? So kind of like I mentioned uh, before, once I get, once I decide I like this flavor and I'm going to keep it around, then maybe I'd start doing more of that. I'm doing it right now with the white truffle and that's not necessarily a phenotype. It's just a cultivar, a phenotype of the cultivar. So once I get further, I do that, but I really like to just integrate it into my garden. So I don't want to push it. Like I know I would never go that much higher with my light. So why do it? I know I would never add much more nutrients. So why do it? Like I wouldn't go and just randomly break branches. So why do it? You know what I'm saying? Like I want it to fit into my garden or else it's not going to fit into my garden. My flavor choice is one thing. I'm very blessed. I work with companies like Franklin Fields so they can grow some stuff that I may not love. I mean, I love it, but I may not love to grow. And then I can grow the stuff that fits for my particular garden. I notice right now everything I have is kind of lankier, got that sativa like look, other than the Shell at OG, which is squattier and, and thick, tight colas already. And so far, like that would have to be a solo run. You know what I'm saying? Like the Shell would have to be like a monocrop, so to speak, where I'm just going to run this 
by itself so I could fill the room up, canopies even, train the same, done right, versus these lanky ones that I have to really manipulate and work to even fit in the same space. It's just the cultivars don't match together. So my light intensity of what I would do to increase it is going to be when I do maybe the solo run by itself. After I've kind of run it through my personal crop, I see how I like it, see it's doing good, move it to a four by four, then push it a little bit. Like, man, can I get maybe more out of this? Can this handle more? Like this may be that, that random unicorn out there that hits all the marks, but then also can take more so I can push it. I've got this uh, X3 Ultra from Chill Tech and it's like, let's see what we can do, baby. Let's see what we can do, you know? So I imagine since you're doing different stressors throughout multiple runs, a common technique that people do, and I believe you do, is you take clones at some point. So you'll grow the plants, and during the vegetation stage, I don't know how, how long you're vegging the plants for, but at some point you're taking clones, and then you're having those clones kind of like on the side on standby. And then you're finishing up your pheno hunt, and then you're, I guess you're taking those clones, and then you're doing your next run. Is that kind of how that's working? Yeah, yeah. The next clone will be like my temporary mother, which I usually don't keep a mother plant around for a while. But just to secure that genetic, I'll have one that I'm like, well, I'm just going to cut on you. You're not doing nothing just to make sure I keep you. Like I don't want to sacrifice it by mislabeling something or it gets lost in the mix. Not happening. So usually what I'll do is about two, three weeks before I flip into flower, I'll do my you know stripping of the bottom area and I'll take most of those cuts, sometimes a couple from the tops, but to make sure I got an adequate amount of time for recovery before I flip the flower. Now, flipping a flower isn't necessarily being in flower, just a light cycle. So I still got that time, that little window of, of vegging still, so to speak. So the plant's really fully recovered by the time I go back in there. Now, the next run of clones is already sitting in the cloner. You're going, and I'm growing them with less, like, full intention. I'm, I'm doing the manipulation to the plant. I'm doing some training, but knowing that, hey, I may not keep these four here, depending if I don't like this pheno. Like, I literally will go in there call the herd if I have to. I don't want to have a room full of stuff I don't like. I've got way more flower of stuff I don't like than what I do. So currently even still like, ugh, don't even want to smoke it. So <laughs> it's to the point where you, you really have to pick and choose when you're in a smaller space and you're pheno hunting, like how many clones am I going to take? Because I may not keep all these clones. I've done that before where I've got 10 of each and it was so stupid because I only wanted to keep one out of five of the phenotypes. And so I had 50 when I was more I had a, more more patience at the time. And it was a big mistake because my whole run was just stuff I didn't like, man. It was just flat as it gets to 80s booty, just nothing. So for me, how I will run my stuff is three clones of each, sometimes two. And it'll be labeled as uh, like chill at OGA, chill at OGB, chill at OGC. And then I've got those added into my phone. And I know that they're within row A, one, two, three. Row B, you know what I'm saying? So that it's pretty easy to know what I've got. And that way, once it comes back through the larger plant that's in flower, that's labeled chill out OGA, chill out OGB, I could choose the one I like and say, I really didn't like this one over here, so you're gone. But you two, I gotta, we're gonna run you again. I'm gonna, I gotta see which, and battle of the bands with you and see which is better. Cause a lot of times for me, I don't know till the second or third run. Like from going from, from directly from the start, yeah, your plant may be hardier. And you have the taproot and everything there. You're, you're doing great there. But then from a clone, I feel like I can really find, like, do I like this smoke? Is this what I want? Growth is a big thing, but I'm a connoisseur. So I want to know after a run or two how it's reacting to my garden, how uh, this next one when it's acclimated to my environment. That's when you really see the, the phenotype expressions, I feel like, is when your environment gets used to it. When I first take in a cut, it's like that runs pretty good. I see it's, it's good. But the next one is like, damn, I don't know what I did. But this is fire. It's like I changed nothing. It's just been here now. It's, I think it's getting used to my routine and the plant is uh, acclimating to it. How long are you typically keeping your plants in the vegetation stage when pheno hunting? This one was longer than normal because I wanted to take a fair amount of cuts. So I kept it in for about maybe nine weeks ballpark. Normally it's six to eight weeks at the most, like at the very most. Because again, the stretch that I normally get with the other cultivars I didn't know anything about the chillets in particular because that's what I'm doing a pheno hunt of right now. I wasn't sure how they grow. I was like, are they going to be lanky? Is it going to be tall? Then how fat and squatty they were to get going, and then they morphed in a couple weeks. I'm like, all right, so we're just going to see what you ladies do and get you going longer. And then I had did a little bit of training to, to two of them that were just a little lankier, and I was like, yeah, it's, I see how you grow. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to train you. And then they were dudes. So I'm like, no. Now, if I was hunting for males, they would have been prime candidates because they reeked. Like, 
outside smells when I cut them down, the garbage reeked. So that was a probably a good breeder. I probably should have got you some pollen there. But <laughs> when you're looking for uh, what's right for you, sometimes you got to give it a little more time because if you want to take a fair amount of cuts, you're going to be putting a, a plant in there that's not at its full potential because it's been hacked on and chopped on and worked, you know? Yeah, I get exactly what you mean. So you've got your plants growing. At what point do you start to kill off plants? Are you letting them grow all the way through and killing them off? Or are you like looking at the characteristics during each stage of growth and then killing off plants? Like, for example, killing off plants in the vegetation stage, then maybe you're putting them into flower and then evaluating what they look like and then killing off plants and flowering, so on and so forth. How do you go about like killing off plants? Yeah, because I'm a, more of a connoisseur than a, like I'm a grower, but I'm a smoker more than anything. I feel like I'm a grower because I'm such a smoker and so so picky. But I do love to grow. Um, I normally don't let it go until it's fully cured. Like I won't even consider cutting them. They're they're gonna stick around until I know. And then sometimes again that second run, I'll let it go through again. I'm like if I would have done this, maybe I let it go a little longer. You know, I know it says you know sixty or seventy days, but maybe seventy five, eighty would have but it brought up something more. So I usually will wait, you know, I'll, I'm not going to kill it. There's been too many times I've had my great white buffalo, so to speak, the one that got away, man, and it's it's depressing. There's the sour kush, I always remember, I'll never forget it. It was so good. And then uh, holy grail kush, that was another one. I went through 10 packs of that one, 10 packs, never found the same phenotype. So it's like, you can't let stuff go until you know. And it's just, it's man, those are bars too, but it's mandatory. It's mandatory. You got to you got to let it go through all the way to see because it could change in the last couple of weeks. That cure could change the game. But if it's growing so poorly and it's going to ruin your production, you may want to call the herd. Just depends. Yeah, because I mean, there's I know there's some phenol hunters that they're looking for that vigor, and if they find like in the vegetation stage that it's just a overall weak plant, they'll kill it off. Then I actually did a phenol hunting talk with Northwest J on this podcast as well. I think it was like episode number five or episode six or something like that, and he was talking about how he's never killed off a female plant. He's always done the same thing you do, which is let it grow all the way till the end, harvest, dry, cure, then consume, and then kind of make his decision there. So yeah, that's. A couple of different ways to go about it for sure. Uh, depends on who you are and kind of what you're looking for within the plant uh, on whether or not you're going to kill off plants at all or if you're just going to let them kind of grow through. My next question, which you kind of already touched on a little bit, do you select just one pheno that is a keeper or multiple phenos? And you kind of already mentioned that, you know, you go through the first run, you'll have multiple keepers, you'll put them through a next run as well are you going through these multiple runs at what point do you know that this is the one all other phenos that i've been working with are going to get killed off it's crazy man it's only been more recently with the new genetics like the last time i remember the last genetics that i popped that there was a clear winner and clear not was tga subcool where i was like i mean they were all good but there's like this is obviously the one they're talking about this is the vortex this is it you know what i'm saying like boom 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 we're good as we're now, it's like the stability of a lot of the genetics, it's not always a bad thing, but it's like there's so many variations that I find within these where I'm like, man, that's so different. Like it's nothing like this yet. Yeah, the plant looks the same, but the flavor isn't even in the ballpark. Like this is gassy, funky. This is total lemon. Like how did they come in the same pack? But they look the same. So at that point, it's like, yeah, I'm keeping them around. But if it's like, well, this one's just as a mild version of this. Like Headbanger is a prime example. Headbanger was either kind of flat, heavier yielder. Like it it looked the same, but it yielded way better. But the smell was just really mild, same with the flavonoids. And the other, which was smaller yielder, looked comparable in the structure, but fire terps just, whew. So it was like, well, dead ass obvious. Which one am I going to keep as the connoisseur? The one that is potent as can be. That's, that's my keeper. So I think it does depend on the genetics you're dealing with. These newer age ones that don't have the right cross or don't have the right testing, uh, you may find a few. You may find like five, six, you know. Some of the older ones that have been tested and been around and been uh, selected properly, it seems like you find less dramatic shifts within those phenotypes, so you won't need to keep as many. There's no reason to have two that are really comparable. What's the point, you know? I know what you mean. I'm actually, like I mentioned, going through a pheno hunt right now, and uh, I'm looking really for a, a shorter plant because... 
the brisker OG side of things is very tall, stretchy, typical OG, very finicky. Once it gets those heavy buds, it'll just be flopping all over the place. While the Pakistan Valley is real short, stout, real nice bud stacking, and uh, kind of stays upright, doesn't really flop over like the like the uh, brisker does. So kind of keeping that plant short was one of the things I was looking at. However, in this grow, I'm, I'm seeing that the ones that are a little bit taller are just packed on with the trichomes. So I'm like, yeah. oh, great. I mean, geez, do I really want to go for the smaller one at this point? Or do I really want to look at the one, you know, keep the one that has the just covered in trichomes? Like there's no, there's not much of a comparison. Now the other ones are starting to stack on trichomes here later on in flowering, which I thought was pretty interesting. But like right off the bat, this particular pheno just stack with trichomes. And it really made me, question whether or not i'm going to keep the shorter one out of the bunch just because it's it's shorter right yeah. uh, because of the trichome production i mean that's something that is more important for me uh, of course when i'm going to go through smoking them all consuming them all and so on and so forth but uh it was kind of interesting how things kind of flip-flopped a little bit for me as i'm going through the hunt yeah well like it that's the big thing too is as a connoisseur i kind of like the the fact that i can get two two holographics in my pokemon card so to speak in my pokemon pack as were before, you just get one, you know. So it's like same thing with seeds. We'll say that's my analogy for you nerds out there. Um, is is you can have more really cool options in one pack, and we're spending that kind of money on these. That's kind of cool, man. Like people will be like, "Oh, which one did you get? You get the one that leaned more brisker, or like that's that's cool." Then you would eventually have a cut that's like, "Oh, this is the particular cut of this because there's two or three highly sought after phenotypes in here." Like I think that's really cool in my opinion. Versus like dud 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 dank like then that's what i'm more used to with a lot back in the day and while those are usually more stable so to speak that's what people will, will scream about as a connoisseur man i like to have some variations i think it's cool yeah i agree with you so there are so many new growers that are coming onto the market today you know starting their grow i mean we've got Rhode Island that just legalized, for example, there's going to be a whole bunch of people from Rhode Island coming on to grow and they're going to start pheno hunting. So we have a lot of beginner pheno huntings that are tuning into this podcast today. What advice do you have for someone who's new to pheno hunting? Labeling. Make sure you label properly. It's so crucial. It's so important. You'll be so bummed out when you're like, oh man, I didn't label this pheno right. And that was the best one. Like It could be this or it's this. And it takes three more cycles to find out. You got to run them all again to be like, ah, I don't know. Well, a cut's a cut. Like you won't know until partway through the growth and then you're seeing some characteristics. But how familiar are you with that plant when you just ran it for a pheno hunt? You know, I've lost some great, great phenotypes, great ones by being a moron and doing too much at once, doing three hunts with 10 packs or 10 per pack each. And so I'm documenting all these different phenotypes and just trying to find if it's male or female, let alone the characteristics of what I want to keep or what I don't want to keep. There's too many variables that come into play. So if you don't properly document and and track things, you're wasting your time. You're just you're just growing a lot of seeds, that's all. How do you physically label the plants? There are different ways to do it. Some people have those like plastic tags that actually wrap around the branches. Some people just do the uh, plant tags that you write on and stick within the soil. Uh, what I'm doing this round is I took a Sharpie and wrote on some painter's tape and then stuck it to the side of my plastic grow pot. How, how do you label your plants? The latter. That's, that's what I do. Oh, get old, good old fashioned tape. And well, it sometimes leaves an ugly mark on your pot. For me, it's very easily visible to see them like boom, boom, boom. All right, boom. And for me, right now, my left side is all chill out OGs of my tent. So I know these are chill out OGs. So I look for A, B, C, you know, easy there. Now I've only got A and B, which worked out because those are the two I like the most. And I don't have as much of an issue when I organize it properly in that sense. Now, not only will they be visibly right there, but then I have it in my phone just in case humidity or some sort of thing happens, the tape falls off, whatever. I just know that, I mean, they're in trellis, so they're not moving. They're being scrogged. Like, not fully scrawled. These are just being trellised. My other side's being uh, more of the screen and green technique. And I know left over here, right over here, it's like battle sh or battleship, you know, or battlefield, battleship. I know that in this coordinate over here, this is this ship. This one over here, this is this ship, meaning, you know, the chill out OGs. So I've got my process down. But when you're doing a bunch at once and you're moving stuff around and they're not all stationary, like very visible, I think honestly probably putting them right around the, the stem or the branch itself for the... Some people do it on the branch of the side, like an apple tree, or they'll do it around the, the base of the... Well, I'm just 
pretty uh, medicated, we'll say. Can't even think of the word. The stem. <laughs> stem. Stock. Yeah. Stock. St- stem, stem stock. stock. Yeah. It, and then you talked about documenting it, and I'm sure you have some sort of, you talk about the columns. So is it like a spreadsheet that you have on your phone, like Google Sheets or something like that? Or like, what is your doc like tracking document look like so on uh evernote you can add tables evernote's a free program where you could do the premium version i have premium because i use it for business but you can have a table that you set up and then you could do a b c d e f g one two three four five six seven eight boom 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 and lay them out like that so that's usually i'll do it visibly or visually like that so that way it's easy for me to just pop it and look doom doom good to go and that's linked to my google keep which says pheno hunting and i can just click that opens up evernote Boom, it's right there. And then that kind of correlates with my cloner. So I can see the cloner set up there. And then basically in that, like the numbers and letters, the first ones are always going to be the ones that are actually in those letters. The other ones are going to just be my grow tent because I don't have A, B, C in the grow tent. I just know that it's laid out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Usually I do eight in my four by eight. Then I'll do four in my four by four. So these are in A, B, C, D. So it's pretty, for me, it's simple. I used to do color coordinating and then I was doing way too much pheno hunting and I couldn't get enough colors. I'm like, why can't we get like an auburn or like a lime green so I can, you know, differentiate all this stuff. But it's it's not easy, man. It's not easy. Mine's pretty similar to what you had mentioned. I use Google Sheets, which is another free program similar to Microsoft Excel. And on the columns, so up top, I actually have the plant So whatever plant number it is, for example, and then on the rows going down would be the date. And then, uh, and I'm just basically looking at the date and then scrolling across to whatever plant and then entering in my notes. What are some of the things that you log? Like, are you tracking, you know, feedings? Are you doing pH, PPM? Are you doing transplant dates? Like, what are you putting on that log? I'll usually do feeding on there. So like if I'm doing, uh, for a long time, I would do like three times a week I'd feed, but in the past year i've been feeding every time i water other than one time i think if it's i go in the room and it seems like really dry and i'm like geez the humidity fluctuates here in michigan often so at that point i'll change it but i notice that the plant if it's having any signs of stress that's when i'll mark it as like all right well i'm switching to flowering nutrients let's mark it let's see how it's going to do oftentimes with those ones i don't have to put anything back there again unless it shows stress but i at least have it marked so i can go back and say all right at this time and it shows the last time the document was edited or it was modified on uh, evernote so i'm like all right this date did this here okay clearly that was the problem it's very obvious to see like you know i consume a lot of my products so sometimes i forget gotta go back and check awesome cool i think that gives a pretty good picture of how you do your pheno hunting i mean there's so many different ways to go about it we talked about just uh, you know some of the characteristics that you can look for in your plants i'd love to know in the comment section below for you guys tuning in what do you look for in your plants when you're pheno hunting definitely let us know so i appreciate you sharing your secrets with us on how you do your pheno hunting tell us how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future well i'm on a show with a dude named pigeons 420 and another guy you may know, may or may not know, I'm not sure, um, because it's Mr. Grow It <laughs> <laughs> from, from the Stash Podcast. Uh, check us out on YouTube or Twitch. Then uh, Rob Blogs, another place. I kind of just put random stuff that I'm doing or, you know, some garden updates here and there, different things periodically. Stuff that doesn't include my partner in crime, not crime, all legal. Uh, Trey Strong's over on CLTV. That's another show we have. And then Top Buds with... Pigeons uh, 520 as well. So all those are available on Twitch and YouTube. Find the socials over on Instagram, Rob Seal TV, and then watch Seal TV for all that. Make it easy. It's just watch Seal TV. Boom. Sweet. We'll definitely have a link to your channel down in the YouTube description section below. If you're on one of the podcast platforms, just search for him. He'll pop up. If you enjoyed this episode, click that thumbs up button. Also subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Every single weekend, I'm releasing a new Garden Talk podcast episode. And I'd love for you to tune into future episodes. Also in the description, I'll definitely link down the episode one that we did. So the first episode, first time around. And if you haven't seen that one, tune into it. It's going to be a lot different. That was almost two years ago. I can't believe how fast time has flied. That was the start. That's how we kind of started, you know? That's how we linked up from the stash game shortly after. It's nuts. Yep. Yep. We started uh, just off of that episode. And then we started a whole new podcast after that. And then... uh, Continued on with the garden talk, and here we are two years later. So oh, yeah. crazy. All right, well, I'll leave it at that. Once again, Rob, thanks for coming on. And Absolutely. for all you tuning in, catch you in the next episode. Peace.